Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Now today is time for a long overdue update on the UNECE regulations. Now let me start with a little story when back in 2015 Elon Musk announced that FSD was going to happen. And then in 2016 we actually got our first version of Autopilot which was awesome and uh, it was working really really great and everybody was happy. And then we fast forward to 2019, June 2019, when the famous R79 UNECE regulation actually came into effect and everybody was feeling kind of like this. Um, so yeah, uh, we got autopilot, we were happy with it. They made it very, very much restricted and I made a full video about it back in the day. But... I got a lot of questions and I still get a lot of questions about this. So let me just uh, get back to uh, what actually happens and what actually is important to understand. So you guys can follow along. I know I've made uh, several videos about it, but I think it's worth repeating some of the bits here. Now, what is the UNECE? The UNECE is a UN regulation and uh, or UN, UN regulatory body. They make UN ECE regulations, so they are UN based. So then why is the US not involved in or not obliged to follow these regulations if, if it's a UN regulation? Well, it is kind of complicated, but let me show you what that actually looks like. So the UN ECE as a governing body uh, has several sub sections which are called working parties. Now the important ones for us are WP1 for road traffic safety and WP29 for harmonization of vehicle regulations. Now the US did not sign into that working party. So although they are part of the UN ECE and the UN in general, they are not bound by the regulations that are defined in WP29, which is why they can allow for FSD. Now, under the WP29, you do have several other uh, kind of working parties or, or uh, bodies uh, for general safety provisions, for passive safety, for brakes and running gear, for autonomous and automated vehicles, uh, for pollution, and so on and so on. Now, the one we are interested in is the GRVA for autonomous vehicles. Underneath, you have different working parties for automatic steering, braking, autonomous driving certifications, cybersecurity, data storage systems, and functional requirements. The ones that are highlighted here are the ones that we are actually interested in as Tesla owners. So that makes it uh, quite difficult to keep track because of this whole hierarchy. And this whole hierarchy also has its own level of meetings. So the bottom level meets like every month. The GRVA meets like every two months, something like that on average. And the WP29, they meet every um, quarter kind of, like three times a year. It's in March, June and September. Now, everything needs to be worked out as a task force at the bottom level. Then it gets approved at the GRVA, usually not in a single go, it has to go back and forward a couple of times. And then the GRVA, if they accept it, the uh, system or the, the, the proposal actually goes to the WP29 um, session, where usually it is just accepting um, the proposal and they, may, they might have some questions left, but usually it's just a formality to approve it at that level. Now, who is in the UNECE? Well, about 68 countries are part of the UNC uh, at the moment. And that includes, since it's UN, not EU, that includes the UK, that includes Switzerland, but it also includes Japan and Australia, for example. So they are all part of that UNECE and that WP29 regulations. Now, if we talk about full self-drive, um, there are several levels of self-driving that are described as the SAE level, so they are the international standard, and they talk about the uh, responsibility, who is taking responsibility for what and under which conditions. So if you talk about level zero, 
uh, there is just like blind spot warning, lane departure warning, more like passive safety features. Level one has one feature active. Level two has multiple features active. So level one, lane centering or adaptive cruise control. With level two, you have lane centering and adaptive cruise control. As of level three, we talk about autonomous driving. So the blue ones, you are responsible at any and all times. The green ones, the car slash manufacturer is responsible for that. So with level three, under certain conditions, you can actually have autonomous driving. Just think about the Mercedes system in Germany where um, it can drive uh, fully autonomous. You can read the newspaper behind your steering wheel. You cannot crawl in the back seat because still need to be, take, need to be able to take over uh, at any time. But uh, it only functions on certain roads uh, under perfect conditions with no tunnels, no roadworks, no emergency vehicles and no lane changes. So it's just a traffic jam assistant or as they say it here, a traffic jam chauffeur. As of level four, you don't actually need a steering wheel. So that is robo taxi, uh, but also like Waymo, they are level four at this point. And we know that uh, Waymo sometimes gets stuck in traffic and then somebody has to rescue it. So it can drive in almost any condition. With level five, it can drive anywhere at any time in any condition from fog to blizzards to heavy rain to dirt roads. And uh, yeah, that is the ultimate goal for a self-driving car. Now, where is Tesla on this uh, scale? Well, the Tesla FSD system is actually just a level two system. Now I say just a level two system. It is a very good level two system, but because Tesla is not taking responsibility for it, it just stays at level two. It might get to capabilities that take on level four proportions. Like it does really well. If you look at the videos from people in the US, it does really well in a lot of situations already it still makes mistakes in quite a few situations as well. So we're not quite at level four yet, uh, but it is moving towards a level four system. As long as Tesla is not taking responsibility for it, well, it is actually just a level two system. Now, there are different regulations that we need to watch for if you want to follow uh, the path towards FSD. So first of all, you have the R79, which is the original regulation that came out. And R79 talks about summon, talks about lane keeping, and uh, talks about semi-autonomous lane changes and the provisions for that with formulas, mathematical formulas to calculate uh, when you can do a lane change, yes or no. If you want a full example with uh, formulas, go check out one of my older videos. I will put the link up here as well. Now, the second one we need to watch for is the R157, which is the regulation for actually ADS, so the autonomous driving system. And um, that is also called ALKS, Automatic Lane Keeping System. And uh, that goes further beyond the uh, R79 and is actually towards level three and beyond. The one we need to watch for right now is the R171 uh, or the DCAS regulation, the driver control assistance system. The name says it's itself assistance system. And that system is, or that regulation actually is what we need to have to allow FSD, the way we know it from Tesla, to happen here in our neck of the woods. Now, um, what we need to do or, or what we need to have for that is system initiated maneuvers. So there are three types of maneuvers. You have the driver initiated maneuvers. You have the driver confirmed maneuvers, which is what we currently have when Tesla automatically uh, uh, suggests lane changes and we have to approve it or we have the system initiated, which is what happens in the US for a long time already, where the car initiates a lane change automatically. Now, it is important to know that a car does not fall into a single category. It's the function of the car that falls into a category. So if my car is just driving on um, the adaptive cruise control, 
then it is just a level one system at that point or a level one function at that point because only one functionality is active. If we stake autopilot with lane centering and adaptive cruise control, then we're talking about a level two system. So the same car falls into different categories because it's the functions that fall into the categories and not the car. Now, what is currently under discussion? Well, that is, uh, first of all, the DCAS regulations. So that's the one we need to watch. We're talking about system initiated maneuvers and hands-free driving on divided highways. So that is currently being discussed. And maybe, just maybe in January, we might get a final version for that on highways. Now, earlier this year, I had a discussion with Mr. Rohan Patel, the ex-vice president. He left Tesla, unfortunately. And he said, well, we need system initiated maneuvers to be approved before Tesla will actually bring FSD to Europe. Now, why is that? Well, because they don't want to litter the code with all kinds of uh, UN ECE flags. They just want to have one code base that is easily applicable everywhere that Tesla can sell their cars. And I somehow understand it. On the other hand, we are stuck with the UN ECE reg regulations. And there are a lot of things that Tesla can do within those regulations. Like, for example, creating that virtual rescue lane is something that Tesla could already do within the regulations, but they don't right now because they're focusing on FSD as a single stack solution instead. Um, what happens, that's all the a question I get asked as well. What happens with cars that don't have the interior camera that cannot do the driver monitoring? One option is, of course, that Tesla does a retrofit for that. I don't think that's very likely to happen because that includes a whole wiring harness that uh, that needs to change, and it's going to be very costly to do that. Um, but they usually, they I think they will fall back to 79 rule or 79. Now, this is when it needs driver monitoring. If we're talking about going to level four functions or level three, somewhat but mostly level four then the driver does not need to be monitored anymore because the car is doing everything and is taking care of everything and then we don't need the interior camera anymore so those cars can in theory jump from the level two that we have right now to level four immediately when the car takes or the company takes full responsibility for the actions of the car so that is a potential option but then we're talking a long way into the future. Now, what are the new developments that we can talk about? So now let's get into the juicy stuff now that we have the definitions out of the way. Is that the ADAS task force uh, September meeting actually put some additional restrictions on the talks. So we were looking good to have a discussion in September at the GRVA to approve system initiated maneuvers, both on highways and on city streets. But just literally a week before the talks, the ADAS task force actually uh, said, no, we want to propose that we just do it on divided highways only and with hands-on. So no eyes off or eyes on hands off maneuvers, just hands on maneuvers. Um, it, it, it actually took everybody by surprise and Tesla is definitely not happy about this. But then again, all the members actually approved it. They could, they could have rejected the proposal, but it was accepted. Now, there are two main reasons why the UNEC is doing this. The first one is they are afraid that the system is not good enough and will cause accidents, which I fully understand, but that is basically covered by the fact that the system is homologated before it is allowed. So the system is thoroughly tested independently before it is allowed. So for me, that part is covered. The second reason why they want to slow down on these regulations is that they fear that the system is too good so that people will rely on it too much, not pay attention anymore while they should be paying attention because it's level two and then cause accidents. So it's a catch 22, which is ridiculous. Uh, either it's not good enough or it is too good and both cases are not good enough for the UN ECE, which, which is just ridiculous in my opinion. But again, 
It's just my opinion, but I think many share it as well. Um, the latest ADES meeting, which was, uh, I believe, two weeks ago or one week ago, actually still didn't include the system-initiated maneuvers. So what they are talking about and what is still a possibility that we can get defined or uh, adopted by the GRVA in January is hands-off driving in a single lane. Uh, so no lane changes. If you want to do a lane change, well, then you have to have the hands-on. And you have to have the hands-on like several seconds before it actually allows you to do the maneuver. Now, if the system is trying to suggest something and then you need to put your hands on the wheel, the system is going to suggest it when the time is right to do it. So your car will be slowing down at that point already because if you have to have like five or seven seconds your hands on the steering wheel before you can confirm the maneuver, uh, yeah, that's going to be difficult. But we'll have to wait and see how Tesla actually resolves that part. Um, so there's still driver confirmed maneuvers. But uh, you can do, if you have long stretches of empty highway, you can do hands-off. You still need to pay attention, though, because it is still a level 2 system. But that would be a big step forward already. Now, let's talk about the actual smart summon. It's also a question I get quite a lot uh, asked. Is, is actual smart summon possible in Europe? Well, yes and no. Summon is active in Europe. Uh, my car has it. It's a hardware 3 car still. I don't think the hardware 4 cars already have it here in Europe, but my car actually can do smart summon. But the problem is that you need to be so close to the car that you can actually just better get in the car and drive it yourself. Uh, because if you look at what the regulations tells us, then this is a screenshot from the regulations. We need to be within six meters of the boundary of the vehicle. Uh, with Tesla, it's even closer than that. It's more like one to one and a half meters. And then usually the camera system detects you and says, well, you're in the way and it doesn't quite work. Now the regulations do stipulate that even this is the maximum operating range. It's not the maximum driving range. The maximum driving range that the car can do is 100 meters. So in theory, you could take the car and walk it like a dog as long as you're within six meters of the car. Now, that is the regulation. So there's two parts to that as well that you have to understand. One part is there is the regulation. Second part is how does Tesla implement it? And with Tesla, they have limited so much that it is pretty much a party trick and nothing more if you can even get it to work, especially now with the new camera vision only system that they apply to it. It is very difficult to get it to work properly. But yeah, it can work. Now, why does Tesla AI then in August put out this message? At the bottom, you can see here FSD in Europe pending regulatory approval. It's always the disclaimer, of course, but they were also foreseeing that the September meeting was going to go great. And then in Q1, uh, or additionally, or, or in the best case, um, it would go to the WP29 meeting in November. And then it would be approved for March to June, somewhere in that area to become active, which is still not Q1. But OK, they were a little bit optimistic. Um, great. But we were looking at full FSD pretty much the way we have it in the US. Now, then came the meeting, the famous meeting that I explained earlier, and it got uh, basically destroyed this promise. Uh, and it's not going to be possible, especially not in Q1. Now, the latest news from the Tesla AI account says that, well, they want to have actually Smart Summon released in Europe, China, and other regions of the world very soon. Again, there is no regulation for or no mention of the remote control procedure in the uh, R171, which is DCS regulations. So it's not falling under that. So then it defaults back to the R79, which has not been amended. So the six meter difference or distance is still going to remain there. Um, so. I'm really wondering, I sent a, a tweet back to them asking for more clarification how they see it, but unfortunately 
no response to my question. So we'll have to wait and see what they will do with the so-called actual smart summon uh, there. But yeah, maybe something is coming. I don't know. But under the current regulations, I don't see any improvements compared to what we currently have here. So what are the timelines that we can think of the realistic timelines? So in November, we have the discussion at the WP29 meeting. The document that is uh, put forward for that meeting does not include system initiated maneuvers. That section is still reserved or blank. Uh, so it's only hands off lane keeping that might get approved at that point or that goes even further towards the January meeting which is more likely and that is finalizing the system initiated maneuvers on highways only with a potential to lift the highway only and hands-on restrictions which is very unlikely because that usually takes many iterations to get that done but potentially the talks are still going it might get lifted by some parties, they want to get it lifted. Other parties, they put their foot down and say, no, we want that restriction still in there. So I don't think it will happen. But if we are really, really positive, then maybe. Then it goes to the March WP29 meeting, which is usually, as I mentioned, a formality. Once the GRVA approves it, there are like a couple of questions, but then the, the WP29 usually adopts it. And then six months later, in September 25, we might get a realistic timeline for DCAS with system initiated maneuvers, either highway only or city streets as well. But I would just take the safe side and say, okay, highway only is the most likely outcome here. So that's almost another year of waiting before that becomes active. Now, what about the city streets then? Well, if it's not lifted, the proposal has been put forward also to postpone it to at least 2027 to discuss the uh, semi-autonomous driving in city streets or on city streets. Uh, knowing the UNECE, most likely that is where the final discussions are starting. So it's most likely 2028 before we can get that. So three more years before we can get anything that is close to the FSD version that we see in the US. Let's hope by the time it is 2027 or 2028, the system is so good and is so perfected in the US that we immediately get the excellent version that they have there as well. But again, I know that from my contacts that Tesla is just simulating at this point the uh, European roads. They are not actively testing it with FSD on a grand scale. They have ADES operators driving around testing FSD, but the mileage they are racking up is just too low to be that significant to move things forward. So yeah, they do a lot of simulation. They do a lot of shadow uh, training, of course, as they have done in the past, but the actual driving, the actual testing is done by the test operators. And that is just a handful of people in each country. So. It is what it is. Now, let's address the elephant in the room. So if Tesla cannot do hands-off driving, why can Ford actually do it? Well, that is because Ford has actually gone through a rigorous and very lengthy approval process, exception process, to get it running. Now with Ford, it is also uh, the case that it can only be used in the blue zones, they call it. And that is in several countries, it's hardly any roads where they can do it. It's usually long stretches of road where there are no exits or on ramps. That is the safest condition and that is where it is allowed. So it's not everywhere on the highway. It is only on certain sections. So don't be too jealous. I know it's great and it would be a great addition for us as well, but it's not hands off driving, eyes on driving with uh, Tesla FSD the way we have seen it in the US, for example. Now, the big question, of course, is, um, yeah, should we hate the UNECE? Well, yeah, sure, we could. But then again, their purpose is for our safety. 
And as I mentioned at the beginning, the reason they exist is to harmonize the regulations between all of these countries. Imagine that that is not happening, then maybe my Belgian car would not be allowed on the road in the Netherlands, which is the neighboring country, or in Germany, or in France. Uh, that would be very difficult to travel around at that point. So the regulations are there for a good purpose, and they are there for the road safety for other road users as well as we in our own cars. The problem is that they are so cautious that everything is moving just way, way, way too slow. Now, what can we as drivers actually do about this? Well, you can talk to your local Tesla owners club and they usually have contacts with the government and they can talk to the Minister of Transport and convince them they can represent us, many of us, as drivers and owners of our cars to say, okay, we want this to move forward. We want this to be accepted because it's the officials and it's not just the minister it's not really the minister but delegates that are in there in the in the talks but they can steer it towards what needs to actually happen so yeah there you have it um this is the unfortunate news that i have for you so something might be coming early 2025 i wish i could have brought other news and better news to you guys but unfortunately it is what it is, and uh, as I said, September 2025 is the most likely target that we need to look forward to. And as always, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and make sure you hit that little bell icon so you don't miss out on any new videos. And for now, thanks for watching. See you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.